This morning we're looking at the next account in the Gospel of John, as I've already told you, the account of the healing of the man at Bethesda. So let's go ahead and read the text. As we begin, I'd like to read for you this morning, chapter 5, verses 1 through 16. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet and walk. And immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, It is the Sabbath and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, He who made me well was the one who said to me, Pick up your pallet and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well, or who had made him well, for this reason. The Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, my father is working until now and I myself am working. I think I read one extra verse because that really is going with what is going to follow. But may the Lord again bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, very briefly, last week we saw Jesus return to Cana of Galilee where he had first made the water into wine. It was his first miracle where he revealed his glory. But here he met the royal official from Capernaum. And remember, the official had come out to ask Jesus to heal his son, who was in Capernaum, which was about a 20-mile walk. And here we learned a lesson about faith. Now, this morning, we see Jesus go up again to Jerusalem for a feast, perhaps the second time he went up to Jerusalem during his ministry for the Passover. And here... He met a man, you might say, saw a man who was desperately in need of healing. Now, because of the length of this text and because of all the lessons that are here, I want us just really to get into what it is that we see from this passage. So let's just look at this under four headings. First of all, I want us to see the place of healing because this is very unusual, the pool of Bethesda. Secondly, the man whom Jesus healed, the one who was 38 years in this particular illness. I want us to see how Jesus healed him. And then fourthly, I want us to see what the man did after he was healed. Now, first of all, let's look at the place of this healing, the pool of Bethesda. Again, we've read in verse 1 that after the events of Cana, Jesus went up to the feast at Jerusalem. Now, John doesn't tell us specifically which feast this was. As I said, could have been the second Passover. Jesus was able to celebrate, I believe, about four of them during his ministry, considering that it went for three and a half years. But whatever this feast was, it was certainly one that all the Jewish men were required to attend. And so Jesus, desiring to honor his Father and to obey him in all things, went up to the feast. Now John continues in verse 2. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. Again, just a little bit of background. The sheep gate here was the gate through which people would bring their sheep that were to be sold at market. 
Uh, some believe it was very near the temple. So going through the sheep gates, seeing the sheep passing through, seeing the sheep pens, it would be a poignant reminder of them of what was going on in the temple, which of course was animal sacrifice and the sheep uh, pointing to perhaps that lamb that God had promised that he was going to send into the world that would take sin away forever. Remember he said to Abraham uh, when he spared his son, God will provide himself an offering, a sacrifice, and he did provide himself. He came into the world uh, in human flesh and provided himself as a sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now next to the Sheep Gate was this pool called Bethesda, which is Hebrew, we're, uh, well, actually it's a Hebrew word, and it means house of mercy. I think uh, well named because here the Lord was showing mercy to the sick. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Dr. John Lightfoot. He, well, he didn't live in our age, but he lived uh, actually in the 17th century. And he was known as a rabbinic scholar. It's interesting that he, he was one of the Puritans, basically. I believe he was at the Westminster Assembly. And his works were so well done that they are still considered to be the authority on the subject today. He believed that this pool had previously been used for ceremonial washing. And that these five porches or porticos had been built for dressing and undressing uh, for the ceremonial washing. Apparently, it was also thought to be a pool where there might have been some of the animals washed, um, not before sacrificing, but during. But now these porches we see were being used to house the infirm. There were many who were lying there who were sick in various ways. Basically, this pool and this area around the pool had been converted into a kind of a hospital. Now John tells us the power to heal these people was actually brought by an angel. Here's the interesting part, verses 3 through 4. John writes, In these, that is in these porticos, lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. Now, I didn't look at the, what was on the screen behind me, but I'm assuming you saw the brackets that are bracketed around those particular verses. And the reason why they're bracketed is because the earliest manuscripts don't really contain that, those, those verses. Now, on the same, by the same token, they actually did show up in the second or as early as the second and third centuries, I believe Tertullian actually made reference to them. But even though these verses may not be in the oldest manuscripts, yet many believe them to be true, that is to be genuine, or at least for what they contain to be true, even if they weren't a part of the original autograph. And the reason being is because verse 7 really wouldn't make sense without them. In verse 7, the sick man answered Jesus when he said, do you want to get well? He says, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. Okay, well, why, why would the pool be stirred up? Well, you see, that's what's being explained here. I think what happened was uh, somebody who was very near to the situation, who knew what was going on, probably added these words of explanation. And we see examples of that really in the Old Testament. I mean, for instance, a book that was authored, or the five books authored by Moses, actually contain an account of the death of Moses. Did, death, did, did Moses write those verses that explain his death after he was gone? No, but a later editor came in and added those words. And of course, we accept that explanation and the people of God accepted it as part of God's word, even though Moses didn't originally pen them. So even though these comments may have been added later by an editor, I think we should see that this is in fact what was going on. Now some following uh, Lightfoot's interpretation about the use of this pool believe that this was really nothing more than uh, a pool that sort of was a collection of the, of the waters that drained away from the temple during the washings and that the blood of the sacrifices actually at this time were draining into the pool even though at, at an earlier time, as Lightfoot said, it was used for ceremonial washings and that the angel was nothing more than a messenger sent down from the temple to stir up the water. But the problem with that, of course, would be it wouldn't explain how the people were being healed. Why would blood in the pool stirred by somebody have any kind of healing efficacy? 
It seems much more reasonable that here the Lord was showing mercy to his people. He was sending an angel periodically to stir up the water and to grant this gift of healing. Angels is something we're going to look at this evening. Uh, are God's servants whom he sends to minister to men, particularly to those who are going to inherit salvation. And from what we see here, the holy angels apparently are involved in healing, maybe a little bit more closely than we were aware of, even as the evil angels may be involved in afflicting us. Now we do know that in Scripture it does seem like certain illnesses came about, about just purely by some spirit afflicting someone. And others seem to be perhaps more naturally caused. Uh, we don't know, but perhaps even evil angels are able to use the things that are in this world as a part of the curse to afflict us. We don't have to assume it's always just natural. So again, they're involved in healing. Now the stirring of the water here was the signal that the angel had descended and imparted this healing efficacy to the water. Apparently this didn't happen very often, at least not on a daily basis, but only at certain seasons. Perhaps it happened during the feasts when the Lord was blessing his people for their obedience in attendance uh, at this feast. But we do know this, that once it happened, the person who stepped in first, or we, we could even assume that perhaps those collectively who stepped in first, who first entered the pool, were healed from whatever affliction they might have. And one thing we should note here is this, that God was providing in his mercy a cure, at least for the people who were able to get there first. But there was something that the sick needed to do in order to be healed. They had to get themselves into the water. It wasn't just that God descended and healed everybody who happened to be in that room at the time. But when they saw the water stirred, they had to believe that there was healing in the water. They had to believe in God's mercy in order to receive that mercy. And really this is similar to what the Lord does through the gospel, isn't it? Because the Lord basically reveals to us this ocean of mercy that he has provided for our sins in the Lord Jesus Christ, that there is a cure for it. That he's, he's willing to wash them all away, but there's something that we have to do. We have to come to him. We have to believe the promise. We have to, as it were, immerse ourselves in Christ by receiving him and trusting him and turning from our sins. I think there's another lesson for us here who are already believers this morning. God tells us over and over again that he has provided for us grace in what we call the means of grace, in the you know, other Puritan writers and uh, theological writers might call them ordinances, things that God has commanded within his church to be done. There is a promise of a blessing in these things. There is an ocean of blessing. But we need to do something. We need to believe that promise. We need to come to those things. We need to use those things or we won't receive the strength, the grace, that we need to, to strengthen and heal our souls. So the promise is there, but we, de we do need to act just as the waters were stirred and they needed to get up and get into those waters. Now this is basically all we know about this pool. We don't know when the angel began to appear and stir the water. We don't know when he stopped doing this, but at least we know this is what was happening when Jesus arrived. Now again, how should we view this pool? We should see it as a token of God's mercy and grace to his people. That God had not abandoned his people. Even though there hadn't been prophets around for some time, except of course the ministry of Christ which was now underway and John the Baptist, there was 400 years of, of silence. There were no miracles up until that time. God basically wasn't saying anything except through his word, just as it is today. But God was showing them that he hadn't cast his people away. He was still drawing near to them in mercy. But I think more importantly, we should see this pool as a picture of the one who came to the pool and healed the man. That is a picture of the Lord Jesus himself, who is a fountain of mercy, who is actually more than a fountain because he doesn't just promise to heal the first person who gets to him wherever he appears, but all who will come to him. He is the ocean of God's mercy, the one who alone can heal our our spiritual afflictions through faith in his name. 
Now secondly, we see the man whom Jesus healed. Here is a man we read in verse 5. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. Now we're not able really to tell what was wrong with him from what John tells us here, only that whatever it was, it was something that had afflicted him for 38 years and was serious enough to keep him from getting into the water first. Apparently he couldn't just jump up and run in. 38 years in this condition. Now just think about the times that you and I have complained about being sick for a day or if we've had to be sick for a week. I mean, two weeks, three weeks at the outset. You know, but here was a man who had been sick for nearly four decades. Now, is that, is that a bad thing? Well, in a certain sense, yes, it's a bad thing. But in another sense, there's actually a positive side to this, isn't there? Uh, Richard Baxter was looking at it in a way that's maybe a little bit different than the way that we would look at it. But writing from his own experience says this, How great a mercy was it to live 38 years under God's wholesome discipline. Now, why would Baxter say something like that? Well, because of what we're going to see in a few moments as to the reason why this man was in this condition for 38 years. Jesus said to him, don't sin anymore lest something worse happen to you. You see, this man was under God's discipline. And it's better, Baxter says, to be under God's discipline than to be well and in the world and on your way to punishment. Baxter wrote this regarding himself. He says, oh my God, I thank you for the like discipline of 58 years. How safe a life is this in comparison of full prosperity and pleasure. Different way of looking at it, isn't it? It's better to be afflicted. It's better to have the little of the righteous than the abundance of the wicked. It's better to stand at the doorway of the house of God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Yes, if you're going to be a Christian, it's going to be tough because there is the discipline of the Lord, which isn't always, as it were, corrective, but it is always instructive, isn't it? Life is difficult as a believer. I don't think we see anyone in Scripture live an easy and plush life. But we need to be thankful because it's a part of God's discipline. It's a part of his love. It's a part of his training to make us more like Jesus. So here is a man who was 38 years under discipline. Now thirdly, we see how Jesus healed the man. In verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? Now, when Jesus went up to the Jerusalem for the feast, we notice he didn't go to the affluent places. He didn't go, you know, to people who were well-to-do and people who were well. He went to the hospital. <laughs> he went to this place where there were people who were in need. Have you ever noticed, if you've, if you've shared with people, evangelized, that when you go to places where people are well-to-do, they don't want to listen to you because those who are well don't need a physician but when you go to places where people are down and out, they will listen to you because those who are sick see their need of the physician. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did because people like this are the ones more likely to respond in a positive way. James writes in James 2 verse 5, Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Well, blessed are the poor, Jesus said, for the, you know, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why is it the poor? It's because the poor are humbled by their circumstances. Uh, they see their needs. And so that's where Jesus went. Now, as Jesus entered, he saw that there were many who were there and many who were in need, but he fastened his eyes on this one particular individual. And why did he do it? Well, it could have been because, well, he knew how long this person had been in this situation, 38 years. He knew that the man wasn't able to get into the water, and we don't know how long he was in that place, if it was all 38 years or if it was just a portion of it. But he wasn't able to get in there. There wasn't anybody to help him to get into the pool. Or it may have had nothing to do with that. It may have simply been because Jesus will have mercy on whom he has mercy as we're told, of course, and by Paul in Romans chapter 9. God delights in mercy, but he will have mercy on whom he has mercy, 
And certainly as we look at the ministry of Jesus, who is it that we see him helping mostly? But those who are the most helpless. He is the help of the helpless. So he approaches the man and he asks him, do you wish to get well? It's not because he didn't think the man wanted to get well, but I think it's because he was simply showing his concern. And of course the man wanted to get well, that's why he was lying by the pool. Now he didn't understand that Jesus was offering to heal him, otherwise he wouldn't have said what he said next in verse 7. Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. His problem was that once the water was stirred, even though everybody around him was sick, suddenly it became every man for himself. No one was basically willing to admit your situation is worse than mine. Why don't you go into the water before me? There was a rush to get in there because everybody wanted to be healed. And yet, in the answer of this man, I don't think we should assume that he was angry or that he was bitter or was showing any malice towards those who were shutting him out. Maybe 38 years under the discipline of the Lord had taught him patience, if nothing else, and to submit to God's will. You know, somebody else got in there before me. It happened. It must be God's will. I just need to wait patiently on him. My turn will come. I think there's a lot we can learn from that particular example. But here's something else that's interesting that may not occur to us at first blush, and that is that in the other cases we've seen so far, Jesus was healing people that knew who he was. And Jesus was pointing to himself as the Messiah before he healed them. But that's not the case here. The man basically wasn't looking to Jesus to heal him. He wasn't really looking to Jesus for anything more than perhaps than, than a help to get into the pool if the pool perhaps could, would be stirred while he was there. And even though he didn't know who Jesus was and even though he didn't even look to Jesus in faith because he didn't know who Jesus was, Jesus still showed him mercy. He says in verse 8, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. Now again, we recognize it's not like this man knew nothing about God. He was a Jewish man. And it's not, it's not as though he didn't have any faith because he believed that God stirred that pool with, a, with an angel and that he would be healed if he got into it. He knew that God was a source of healing, but he didn't know that Jesus was the Son of God. He didn't know he was the Messiah. And yet Jesus healed him anyway. Now again, God reserves the right to show mercy where and when he will show mercy. And we need to be thankful that he is like that because for many of us here, we weren't even looking to God for his mercy when he sought us and saved us. If we had to look to God first, well, again, we couldn't even do that without God's particular mercy. But God is the one who seeks us out. God is the one who will have mercy on whom he has mercy. Sometimes we don't even need to be looking for him and God will bring the gospel to us and he will save us. Sometimes he does have us look. Sometimes he has a search for a while, but not always. But I want you to notice in this case as well as in the case of the pool of, of Bethesda, God provides something, but yet there's still something that we need to do. Jesus issued the command, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. But still the man needed to respond, didn't he? If he was going to receive this mercy, he needed to believe what Jesus said. He needed to respond to what he said. He needed to obey it. He needed to stand up, as Jesus told him. He needed to pick up his bed so that everybody could see that he was healed. And interestingly enough, he had to walk with his bed. In other words, he had to be willing to carry this bed on the Sabbath day. You notice how Jesus tends to heal on the Sabbath so that these issues continue to arise. Well, the man knew that the Jews would know that carrying his bed on the, on the uh, Sabbath was, was, in their view, a sin. But he had to be willing to do this. Now, here's another interesting thing. Here is one occasion where Jesus wanted the Jews to see this miracle. He wanted to bring glory to his father in this miracle. He wanted to testify against the tradition of the elders who misunderstood and misinterpreted the Sabbath 
And he wanted to see if this man was willing to obey him, even though he knew that he would be censured if he picked up that pallet and began to walk with it. And was the man willing to do this? Well, he was. We read in verse 9, Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. Now we do need to recognize, of course, that when Jesus spoke this word, the man instantly felt himself become well, like the woman with the hemorrhage. When she reached out, she thought, if I only touch the, the hem of his garment, I'll be made well. And when she touched it, she immediately sensed within herself the issue of blood stopped and she was healed. This man could feel the virtue, as it were, the power of healing come into him. He felt himself become well, and I think certainly because, too, he was willing to obey Jesus because of, only because of God's mercy, and he did. He got up, he picked up his pallet, and he began to walk, again knowing that he would have to suffer for it. So again, I just want to point out the gospel is not only an offer, whosoever will, let him come and take of the water. But it's a command. Repent and believe. Turn and live. Get up and walk. Now again, we know that we really can't do any of these things apart from God's grace, but we also know that God holds us responsible to do it now, even if we may not have that ability. And of course, how can you know whether or not God has given you the grace to get up and walk? or to turn from your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ unless you at least attempt it. Jesus says to you this morning, get up and come to me if you have not come to him. You need to come to him. You need to turn from your sins. You need to take hold of him by faith and be willing to do whatever the Lord calls you to do. Even if it means like this man, you will have to suffer for it. That's what it means to come to Christ. Get up. And come to him, trust him, turn from your sins and follow him. Be willing to pay that price. Now finally, we see what the man did after he was healed. I've already told you that Jesus did this miracle on the Sabbath. We're going to see next time that Jesus will defend the fact that he doesn't stop working on the Sabbath. He doesn't cease ministry on the Sabbath because this was the kind of work that could be done on that day and because he never took a day off from doing his father's will. He was 24 hours a day, seven days a week, a Christian. <laughs> Again, as an example to us, you know, we're not supposed to take breaks from being Christians, right? We're supposed to be Christians all the time and following the Lord all the time and seeking him all the time. One of the reasons why I know in my own life I'm not stronger than I am is because I don't see the Christian life in that way. We all tend to do that because of the world we live in. But if we sought the Lord all the time and sought to be used by Him all the time, that is one of the secrets, I believe, of spiritual strength and maturity and becoming more like Jesus. Not just here on the Lord's Day, not just in preparation for the Lord's Day, not just the Lord's Day, but all the time seeking the Lord, all the time seeking to be used by Him, all the time seeking to be soul winners as we've been encouraged by Spurgeon. But when the Jews now saw this man carrying his bed on the Sabbath, of course we know what they thought about it. They thought he was sinning. And so they addressed him in verse 10. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, it is the Sabbath and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. Well, the man replied that he was merely obeying the one who healed him. He says in verse 11, he answered them, He who made me well was the one who said to me, Pick up your pallet and walk. I don't think he was trying to shift the blame, so to speak, but I think what he was saying was, Surely the one who has the power to heal me and to make me well, the one who has power over nature itself, also has the authority to tell him what he could do or not do on the Sabbath. Well, certainly he does, but the Jews didn't agree. Now, they had, I think, a fairly good idea of who this one might be that told this man. After all, I mean, how many people were there in Israel in those days that had the power to heal? How many were there who were doing controversial things like this on the Sabbath? But to find out for sure, they asked him in verse 12, 
Who is the man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? Verse 13, but the man who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Now again, just reminding you, this man didn't even know who Jesus was, and yet Jesus still healed him. Now, he had likely heard about Jesus, but he had never seen him before, so he didn't know who this one was who healed him. And yet the Lord healed him, even though he really only had faith in God and faith in that pool. Now, Jesus, it's interesting, again, Jesus is later going to do exactly the same thing in the case of a man who was blind. He's going to come up to the man and there's going to be questions surrounding him. He's going to apply clay to his eyes and he's going to heal him. And this man doesn't even know who it was that healed him either. Sometimes God shows mercy before he reveals himself to them. And I want you to realize too that both of these men, I believe, after the Lord healed them, actually came to know him. They both uh, appear to afterwards, again reminding us of this. John says, we love because he first loved us. We came to Christ because he was first seeking us. The only reason why we ever respond in the way that we should to the Lord is because he initiated so that we could respond. It's his mercy and it's his grace. Now, I want you to notice where the man went after Jesus healed him. It's likely that this, that this man didn't have a family. I think we can assume that, not only because of his predicament, but the fact he had nobody to help him into the pool. Surely if he had a family, one of his family members would wait there with him as much as they could to help him into the pool. I think it's likely he didn't have a house to go to at that time. No family. He hasn't worked for 38 years because he's basically been, he's had some kind of an illness that made him at least partially crippled, if not wholly crippled. So he didn't go to a house. He just basically left the house where he had spent the last several years of his life, which was the, you know, the pool of Bethesda and the porticos. Um, we don't know how long he was there, but it was probably for some time. So where did the man go? Well, we read in verse 14 that he went to the house of the one who had mercy on him. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple. Now, why did the man go to the temple? Because he had no place else to go? Was he looking for a handout? No, I think he went there to give praise to God. When the Lord shows mercy, we should always be ready to give him a sacrifice of praise. And when isn't the Lord showing us mercy? So when shouldn't we be thanking him and praising him? We should be doing this all the time. Now again, here's where we get a glimpse of, of what caused this illness in the first place, which is why Baxter said what he said in verse 14. Jesus said to him, because he met him in the temple, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse happens to you. It implies that this condition he's had for 38 years came about because of some sin that he had committed. God says in his word that he blesses obedience, but God is also just as serious when he says he disciplines disobedience. It does matter how you and I live. Now Jesus said to him, don't sin anymore so that nothing worse will happen to you. Um, I think that that was said to him because of this. He's, he's been sick for 38 years. In those 38 years, I doubt that he was tempted to sin because he was really unable to do it except maybe in his mind and in his heart. But I think we've already seen indications that he had pretty much humbled, been humbled and uh, wasn't... Um, you know, angry at God, but had learned patience. Well, now that this sickness is over, now that Jesus has delivered him, now the temptation was going to be there again for him to go back into sin. So Jesus mercifully gives him this warning as a safeguard to him. What does Solomon say about wisdom and the fear of the Lord in the book of Proverbs? In Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear is a very powerful and gracious motive which is designed, among, uh, among other things, to keep us from sinning. Every time we receive some mercy from the Lord, we need to realize that we're going to be tempted to sin. 
It, it's, it's almost, you know, going to happen every time. So every time we receive a mercy from the Lord, we should hear Jesus saying these words to us, go and sin no more. Don't sin any further, otherwise something worse may befall you to realize that, that there is discipline for sin. So if God shows us some mercy, if he relieves us from some situation, don't use it as an excuse to renew your pursuit of the world or any other sin, but rather that you might honor him. That's the reason why he shows you the mercy in the first place. Now finally, now that the man knows that it was Jesus who healed him, he wants to honor him. So he immediately goes out and he tells those Jews the answer to the question that they had asked him before. In verse 15, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Now he wasn't trying to injure Jesus. He must have been thinking that somebody who was so gracious and somebody who was so good could hardly have any enemies in this world. But he was wrong. And we see that instead of applauding him, the Jews did what unbelievers do. They began to attack him. We read in verse 16. For this reason the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Now again, sometimes perhaps in our, in our own desire to, um, to honor the Lord, we might do something similar. You know, we, we want people to know about Jesus and so we come to people and we tell them about him and Sometimes we end up telling people who really hate Jesus and say some spiteful things and they're really his enemies, his sworn enemies. Well, the Lord warns us against doing that, doesn't he? He warns us against giving what is holy to the dogs, casting our pearl before swine. He tells us that we should be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Jesus told his own men as he sent them out to preach and proclaim the gospel, if they don't receive you here, then shake the dust off your feet. Go somewhere else. Don't continue to try to minister to them if their hearts are bent against the gospel. Sometimes, again, the right thing to do is not to tell people or not to continue to pursue them with the gospel, at least if they have shown themselves to be adamantly opposed to the gospel. We just need to be careful. Now, we do need to recognize that there are varying degrees of enmity against God. Everyone who is an unbeliever has some degree of enmity towards the Lord. And we just need to be careful if that should be a great amount of hatred, not to cast pearl before swine. So let me just say in closing, though, just, just to apply this in, in one last way, and that would be to those of you here this morning, perhaps who don't know Jesus Christ, you see, you don't have to be hardened to this degree that the Jews were to be the Lord's enemy. The Bible basically says if you haven't turned from your sins, if you haven't turned from your rebellion against the Lord and trusted Jesus as your Savior, you are in fact the enemy of the Lord. If you're not for Jesus, you're actually against Jesus. Now, you need to, eat, to understand, too, that even though you might not, you know, even though you may be his enemy, and the Bible does say in a, in a very real way that there is warfare going on between God and the sinner. I mean, we're not only his enemies, but he is our enemy. That God has decided to be gracious. God has decided to be merciful and to extend the olive branch of peace through his Son. The Lord doesn't stand against you. He's not telling you not to come in because you're his enemy, but rather he stands calling to you to put down the weapon of your warfare and to come to him because he is willing to forgive you. He is willing to wipe the slate clean. He is willing to offer you a new life if you're only willing to receive his offer if you will only obey his command. Now again, that pool called Bethesda, which was again, you know, the, the, basically the house of mercy, was really a picture of the grace that God offers to you in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is an ocean of mercy and love for everyone who will trust in him. And so if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ, if you are his enemy, Put down your weapons because the Lord desires to be reconciled to you through his son. 
put away your hatred. God is showing you His mercy and His grace. Come to Him. The water of the pool has already been stirred. We might say that God has been stirring the water even since the fall of man. He has been disposed to be merciful. He even redeemed Adam and Eve to Himself. He has issued a promise all who come to Him will be healed. All you have to do is come. All you have to do is receive that gift of eternal life. So will you do that? God is asking you that question. Will you come to Him? Will you receive His mercy this morning? Don't trust that God is going to give it to you under any other terms than coming through Jesus Christ. Remember, there's only one way. God would not have sent His Son into the world to die on the cross and to go through all that agony if there were many ways to come to Him. If you could bypass His Son, He never would have done this. There was only one way. So may God grant to you His mercy. And may He grant that you would come to Him through Jesus Christ and be cleansed of your sins through faith in His name. Let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's, um, let's ask the Lord to apply all the things that we've seen this morning to us as we need to hear it um, individually. Let's pray.